so that's kind of how do we, you know, once we, once we get these patients in, um, how do we measure the patient impact? How do we measure the impact that we're having on their life? And so, and how do we measure how severe their symptoms are and how do we measure how their outcomes are? Um, so those are kind of the, the three main categories where we have um, validated grading scales. Um, the first is the Chiari Health Index for Pediatrics. It's a quality of life index that's specifically um, designed around Chiari malformations and symptoms specific to Chiari to assess the daily uh, function and quality of life. Um, the Chiari Severity Index was developed to um, try and predict outcomes following surgery. Uh, and then the Chicago Chiari Outcome Scale is a measurement tool to evaluate outcomes following surgery, and it uses four different parameters. So we'll talk about each of those separately. So the Chiari Health Index for Pediatrics, um, this was developed out of Vanderbilt University. It is a 45 item questionnaire and it's specific to the quality of life measures for patients with Chiari. So there are a lot of quality of life measures out there that have been validated. Um, but this was really focusing on those types of symptoms that most impact the quality of life of these this patient subset. Uh, there are two primary domains. They include the physical domain, which has to do with the pain frequency, the pain severity, um, and some of the non-pain symptoms that they're having, and then psychosocial domains. So you can see this, this is actually the entirety of the questionnaire. It has, you know, everything from headaches or pain in back, arms, legs, um, and it's both how frequent this pain is occurring and how severe the pain is occurring. Um, some of the non-pain symptoms are usually those activities of daily living, um, handwriting, raising your arms, walking, playing sports, um, or sensation, um, tingling, numbness, trouble with your swallowing, um, going to the bathroom frequently, losing your balance, um, and then general activities of daily living. And then the psychosocial has everything to do with kind of their mood and their feeling interacting with other um, with other children and kind of how they're doing in school and different schoolwork. So this was validated to measure health related quality of life over time. Um, and it actually was shown to correlate with changes in symptomatology. So as the symptoms improved following treatment, um, the health related quality of life, um, as measured by this, uh, improved. Um, and this was greatest uh, when they were validating this. This was noted to be greatest in patients that presented initially with neck or back pain, um, with headaches, and those patients that had a searing. So those were the patients that ended up doing the best following decompression. The Chiari Severity Index. Now, this was developed... Um, it was sort of retroactively developed. So what they did is they looked at this cohort of patients and um, sort of figured out how they did and kind of lumped them based on a couple different um, categories. And in doing sort of multivariate analyses of different um, presenting symptoms, they were able to find out which symptoms correlated in their cohort with patient outcomes. Um, so looking at the patient outcomes and then working back to initial presenting symptoms, they developed the Chiari Severity Index. And so this was intended to be used before surgery to assess potential for improvement in quality of life. So it's very important that the outcome measure that they were looking at was quality of life outcome. Um, so not specifically just symptomatology. Um, so initially they wanted to evaluate kind of two main categories. They wanted to look at the clinical information, uh, which was predominantly the headache, uh, headache and myelopathy, um, but also the radiographic information. So the uh, level of tonsillar descent uh, and the size of the syrinx. Um, and so when they looked at all that, the um, headache, uh, myelopathy and the syrinx size had the greatest correlation with the quality of life following surgery. And so they lumped these into three different categories. Um, so they had kind of this, you know, the clinical grade was graded one through three, and that was, you know, grade one was either that classic occipital Chiari headache or generally kind of poorly localized headache. Uh, clinical grade two um, was a frontotemporal headache or no headache at all. And clinical grade three uh, were patients that predominantly had myelopathy. 
Um, and then the neuroimaging grade had to do with either um, an absence or a syrinx or a syrinx that was less than six millimeters uh, or a syrinx greater than six millimeters. Um, and that was category A and category B. And what they found is this sort of, it, this classic Chiari headache, um, no matter what size of the syrinx, had the best response to surgery. So these had the biggest improvements in quality of life. The next group were those patients with small syrinxes that either had kind of not that classic Chiari headache or no headache or myelopathy. And the patients that had the least improvement in their quality of life were the large syrinx um, with either frontotemporal headaches or myelopathy. And so this was developed based on, on this. And it again, this is really looking at post-operative quality of life rather than the true clinical outcomes. Um, so there's still additional studies looking at how well this, um, this is as a predictive tool. Um, and again, some of the studies that are looking at back are, are comparing kind of clinical outcomes rather than quality of life, which is not what it was validated for. So it's important when you use these types of tools to understand how they were designed and what they're intended to predict or measure. And then finally, the other main tool that we have is the Chicago Chiari's Outcome Scale. So this is a um, post-operative clinical outcomes measurement. So this is based on their clinical outcome, not a quality of life measurement. Um, so it evaluates things in four categories. They have pain symptoms, um, which included anything like their tuss of headache, if they had neck or shoulder pain, any dysesthesias um, of the upper extremities. They had a category for non-pain symptoms, which were dysphagia, ataxia, vertigo, weakness, um, sensory loss, um, if they had any paresthesias, tinnitus, if they were having drop attacks, or if they actually had a syrinx, so radiographic evaluation. Um, the third category is their overall function. Um, and then the fourth category actually brought into consideration if they had any complications from the surgery. Um, so this was created as a 16 point scale. The range is four to 16. So each one of those, you can get a one to a four. And so one um, in the pain and non-pain symptoms correlated to worse uh, post-operatively. Um, so whatever their pain was became worse post-operatively to unchanged, improved, or completely resolved. Um, and then from a functional functionality measurement, um, if they were either unable to attend school or work, if they had moderate impairment, uh, mild impairment, or if they were fully functional, and then the complications were anything that, you know, persistent complications being kind of the lowest score and no complications being the highest. So this was, this is one of the ones that's actually been looked at is, you know, is this a predictive measure? Um, and, and overall, if you kind of take all comers and Chiaris, we think there's probably a greater than 70% chance of achieving a good outcome. And that was defined as a as a score greater than 11. So if you kind of look at this, you know, again, most of those symptoms are going to be improved if not resolved with minimal impairment and, and either only a transient complication or um, no complications. Um, and then when they were looking at kind of the individual symptoms and what was least likely to um, improve or have a good outcome, if they had dysesthesias or paresthesias or hyperesthesias, um, they were more likely to have a poor outcome. Um, and we figured out that the degree of herniation really doesn't correlate. Um, we've slowly been figuring that out over time. And then patients with a syrinx actually do the best. Um, so those are the most likely patients to experience a good outcome. And then children, more so than adults, are more likely to experience a good outcome. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.